new week another new show new live stream and our shows are now available on spotify and wherever podcasts can be heard if you want to listen to just the audio you can do that check out nuance with mike scala and jay carter of course i am mike scala joined once again by jay carter aka timid the hip-hop mc as well as the chair of blm tokyo what's going on timid what's going on with you and also they can check it out on the YouTube channel that we uh, have set up so they can get the replays of all of these uh, videos. So jump over there and subscribe as well. That's right. Subscribe. Not only are the full episodes on there, but we also post clips. So if you subscribe, you'll see some relevant clips on your YouTube timeline. Absolutely. Right. We're joined also this week by a friend of mine, William Ruiz, former city council candidate and primary opponent in 2017. So former rivals, but Certainly a friend, and it's good to have you with us. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you for inviting me to your wonderful podcast. And Jay, thank you also for extending the hand. It's my first time on, so I'm very interested in, uh, in finding out what, what we could talk about that the public could actually enjoy and also learn from. Absolutely. And we do this as a public service, really, a podcast and video live stream, all these different things. But we're trying to put information out for the people, try to be entertaining too. You know, we're, we're entertaining, but it's really about keeping people up to date in terms of what's going on in the world and locally too. Right. Sounds good. So we'd like to start off with something on the lighter side. And I know, Jay, you have something. It's kind of strange, but it's certainly lighter than some of the other topics we'll be getting into. Yeah. Um, so... Congress is holding a, a congressional hearing on UFOs. Okay. So again, yeah. And there are a lot of people that hold certain, you know, views and opinions on whether they think UFOs are real, but uh, Congress is, uh, is holding a hearing on that now. And I understand on UFOs. this isn't the first time they've done it, although it is the first time in a while. Right. I don't really understand why are we devoting federal resources to this? Uh, maybe it's a, a matter of national security if we're really concerned about being evaded, hopefully not by aliens, but maybe by you know other countries covertly. I don't know. You know, but we got enough ETs out there. If, he, if ETs out there flying around our airspace. Well, I, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, <laughs> a couple of years back, uh, in Flushing Meadow Park, they used to have these big festivals where they, it was a Colombian festival. And I used to go every year. So one, one year I, I told my wife, said, hey, you know what? Let's go to this uh, festival and let's have some fun. Well, we get there and there was no festival. So now she's upset. It's like, well, you told me this. And I said, well, you know, it, it was here a couple of years ago. So, you know, it's not my fault. So we decided to take the kids out to the swing. You know, it's a big park. And you know that LaGuardia Airport is not too far, but the planes fly very, very low. So there was a plane flying by. And I looked up and I said to myself, I would hate to live here. Well, for that noise, I mean, they fly so low. And believe it or not, as I stared up to the sky, I saw something that looked like a UFO. It was shaped as a triangle. I mean, it was all the way, it was so far up. It was about that small. And at the time I had a very crappy phone. I tried to zoom in, I couldn't get it, but I had my eye on it and it was white and it had little round lights in the bottom. Now I turned around and told my wife, I said, hey, look, if you look up here. So she's like, guy, you're losing your mind. I said, I said I'm serious, it's right there, don't you see it? And before you know it, it moved like over there. And we had this big discussion. She thought I was losing my mind. I said, I'm not losing my mind. I know what I saw. Anyway, the next day I went to my job and I went on a computer and I said, let me look for images. Now they showed you this long list of all these images and I found the one that I saw. Now, you're talking about UFOs, the, the states are talking about UFOs. It's something that <clears throat> I thought I saw. It could have been anything, but these, this was so high in the sky that you couldn't really see it but i just happened to see that because it was like right next to a um to a cloud 
and then it suddenly just disappeared. It's like, but it's something that you know you 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 think about, it, and if you talk about it, people think you're crazy. So I never mentioned it to anybody until now. <laughs> now you just mentioned it to everybody, but the U and UFO is unidentified, right? So right. it's it's real because if it's not identified, then it's yes, yeah, we can't classify. We don't know what it is. It's unidentified, so. Yeah, and it doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily mean that it's an alien craft or whatever. It just yeah. means that it's unidentified. And, and right. one of the reasons why, I mean, of course, the public is fascinated with it, um, but there have been a lot of sightings from military of UFOs. Military pilots have, have made a lot of sightings and their they're, they're recordings where they, they call it in on the radio of, of aircraft that, that um, fly out near them and take, you know, changes in direction that are just not consistent with any aircraft that we know of. And even um, astronauts have reported things when they're in orbit. Um, so, you know, it can sound kind of crazy, but there are other sightings as well. So it's, you know, it's something to look into. You know, now are we being visited? I don't know. I always thought that if time travel is something that we can invent or we will invent in the future, then there would be people here with us now that have time travel from the future. But because we don't see that, that seems to suggest to me that humans will not invent time travel in the future. But they keep on low profile. Maybe. And if they do, Mike, I won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what happens with the, you know, with, um, with the result of, of the hearing. Yeah, who um, came from that? Do we hear anything? What's right. being discussed at the hearing? Yeah, they haven't really, I think they did a, They did close the doors on some of the stuff. Okay. And, and also, you know, our government's not the first. Um, I believe it was probably about 10 years ago where, where Mexico, Mexican government came out and said, um, you know, their encounters with UFOs as well. And so, you know, hey, it's, I think it's better to know than not know. So, oh, so yeah. Hopefully, you know, Space Force can handle that for us. That's something you should just keep in mind, right? People talk about waste. I think there are a lot of people who are going to be concerned that we're waste, wasting our money. You know, we can't take care of our people in the country, but we can spend money chasing UFOs. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there is also the potential for it to be a. a uh, a national security threat too. If it's a type of aircraft that our military doesn't know about from another potential hostile government, then they need to kind of keep an yeah, eye on that I as think well. That's the more serious side of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but speaking of serious, another serious week in the news. Of course, the past few weeks we had some very serious topics cover, and that's not slowing down with this incident in Buffalo. One of the most tragic situations that the country has experienced in a very long time. Yeah. So, so much to get into and so many topics that really stem from that. I guess we just start with sending our condolences to those affected by such a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's um, my heart goes out to the families and friends of those they lost. Um, I, I was uh, a friend of mine sent me the video. And I thought I was looking at a video game. Hmm. I, it looked like one of those code of honor type of games. Um, but it hit, it hit me really hard because, um, you, you know, I lost my mother to gun violence. Hmm. You know, mother was killed. And um, so when I, I, when I saw the first shot, you know, I, I was like, oh man, this is, that's scary, you know? And then, you know, when you want to pull back, you want to turn it off and continue looking at the same time, you know, you're playing like double Dutch. And, and I saw as much as I can. And, and it was like, I was sick to my stomach, you know? So I, I felt, I felt that pain. I, I was like, it was horrible. It was really, really bad. Um, I don't know what, what this young man was thinking about as far as, you know, him thinking that the minorities are going to take over. Um, you know, to me, everything is a learned behavior, right? You know, you hear people talk about it, and especially when you have the uh, the the government talking about it. Some of the high officials on our government level That's talking right. in this language. 
including a U.S. Congresswoman from New York. Uh, you know, it bothers me that you have that level of government talking like that when they should be concentrating in, unite, <clears throat> in uniting the country. They should be talking about laws that they're going to be passing that's going to benefit the, the people they represent. Instead, they're out there dagging at each other. You have certain, you know, news uh, media, right wing, left wing, there's nothing in the middle. They're, they're actually, instead of reporting the news, they're reporting their personal feelings towards their audience. And obviously, you know, if you're not strong minded, you know, if you're not open minded, you're going to believe what it's told. You know, I have a problem with that, Mike. I really do. And, um, and it needs to stop. It really does. You know, I, I've always said, I just had a conversation with a friend of mine earlier today when I said, you know, the cell phones with the cameras is, is good and bad. It's social media is good and bad. Because when you didn't have any of that stuff, you didn't know anything, right? So it was only what you saw at the moment is what, you know, infuriated you if it was something that was bad. Now you watch the social media and it's just like over and over and over and over again. And, and it's very, very bothering to me. It really is. And we need to unite. I feel bad for those people. I feel bad for the family of that young man. You know who? You, you, I, I, we don't raise our kids to be that way, right? At least I, I don't teach my kids that. I'm sure whoever is listening don't teach their kids that. But sometimes it's a learned behavior from outside. And sometimes inside is in the house as well. It all depends, right? But um, it really hit me hard, Mike. It really did. Um, I regret watching it, but I couldn't, I couldn't hold back. You know, I just wanted to see it. And then I thought about my mother, how she was shot. And my mother was shot in the face. So, and um, it was hard because the person that did it was my stepfather that did it. You know, it wasn't a stranger from the street. And, you know, and that goes hand in hand a lot with mental illness, right? It's not identified immediately until you start actually talking to a person when they start going off the wall on you for, at a, at a, in a blink of an eye, the whole conversation changes on you. And um, so, you know, we talk about gun control. Listen, man, we're going to have guns no matter what. You know, guns are out in the street, regardless. And, but we have to really monitor those people that really need the help, you know? And I don't think there's enough services. Oh, let me correct myself. I think there's enough services out there. I don't think the providers are doing enough to provide the services for these people, you know? And that's a lot of topics there that I think we want to get a little bit deeper into. First of all, I saw a bishop who represents that community. I believe he's also the president of their city council or something like that, um, who said that if you don't acknowledge that racism is a problem and that white supremacy is a problem, don't bother sending your help. So he's taking that stance that, you know, we do want help as a city and as a people, but we need to address the underlying issue as well. We can't turn a blind eye to it. And so... That is a very important concern that white supremacy is out of control. And you know what? These ideas that we consider fringe ideas that reasonable people, rational people would consider extremist ideas have become more mainstream as a result of certain programs, certain cable news networks like Fox News, certain social media pages, certain, like I mentioned, Congress people, people in our government, they are making extremist views mainstream by normalizing them. And that's a very serious problem that we deal with right at the outset here. Absolutely. There was a, I think there was even a, um, an article that came out, an opinion piece in one of the major newspapers recently that, that said that exact title that um, the fringe, the, the Republicans are making the fringe mainstream in that regard. Um, but on, on this one, and you mentioned like, you know, white supremacy, um, this was, pretty clear that this was kind of his, you know, his motivation. Um, he had a manifesto that was written out um, 
And he went specifically, it said that he went specifically to this area because this was a large area where black people lived. And of the 13 people that, that he shot, 11 were, uh, were black, uh, two of them were white. And in his manifesto, there was, you know, talked about this replacement theory. It also had pages on anti-Semitic uh, and racist memes. Um, so, you know, he was very motivated by, by racism and hate. Hmm. Yeah. So the question is, I guess, what do we do about it? William mentioned mental health services and we need that. I think that there's never a simple solution to anything like this. I mean, this is a very complicated issue, but what about monitoring? Something the New York governor mentioned was she wants to see social media activity monitored more by law enforcement to keep track of patterns like this. She mentioned the fact that the alleged shooter in this case was not on law enforcement's radar and maybe he should have been, maybe there should have been more of an assertive approach in finding people like this, making these statements so that we can watch them. Is there a danger though in overreaching here? I just want to make one point. We don't know if this was a mental health case with this guy. I don't want to like take away any of his personal responsibility in this case. He could just have hate and that could have been himself, could be learned and taught from his family, could be people around him. It might not necessarily be a, a a mental well, health issue. I, I hear you, but yeah. don't you have to be mentally ill to do something like that? It's, it's uh, I think that takes away your personal responsibility. That I, gives... I, I hear that as well. It's always tricky to me. I mean, like, even like in a regular criminal case when people try to raise the insanity defense and they're like, no, this guy was not insane. He knew exactly what he was doing. He, you know, he's completely normal. But like, when you look at like what they're accused of, it's not normal, right? Like a normal person doesn't behave that way. Mm -hmm. So how could you say that like, this is a regular well-adjusted person who does something like this? Right. Anybody in their right mind would think twice about that, right? Um, you would hope. You would think. Yeah. You know, me mental illness is not identified immediately. You know, it's only when you have this type of acts like this or some other stuff that's out of the norm is when you actually find out, look, I'm going to go back to my stepdad again. You know, here's a guy that seemed normal to me. It was only until he got a psych evaluation that we came to find out, I came to find out through the years, the history that he had as a child. I mean, stuff that I was like, my God, you know, this should be out there before you date somebody, <laughs> you know? And, um, and it, it's, it's real, man. It, it really is. It's scary is what it is. It's scary because nobody listen we all have some kind of hate in our heart right somebody does cut you off in the street you know you start cursing but are you going to go to the to the extreme and take out a bat and start beating people down and you, you you're like what's wrong with you you know really now if you if your family's threatened you come to threaten my family then we, we have an issue right doesn't make me that I'm crazy or anything, but if I'm going to go out there in the street and start walling out, you know, there's something wrong with you, my man. You know, there's something wrong. But I think Jay also raises a very yeah it, point, which is that you don't want to try to absolve responsibility or give someone an excuse by saying, oh, they were just mentally ill. No, mm -hmm. you have to give them the responsibility. And you can't even like going back to my earlier example, you can't say everyone who commits a heinous crime is insane. Therefore, they shouldn't be punished for it. No, we, we do have to punish people who act this way. So I do agree with that. And I guess we really should leave any diagnoses to the mental health professionals. I guess the larger point is that there needs to be more mental health services available, whether or not it applies directly to this case. Right. That is something mm -hmm. that needs to be. A, a part of the conversation in addition to the punishment and the criminal justice component. Right, absolutely, that's absolutely. Mm -hmm. So getting back to my question then, do we think that there's a danger that if we do more, if the government does more, if law enforcement does more to monitor social media activity, is there a danger of overreach and that people will be swept in who shouldn't be, and is that even a concern of us? Or should it be a concern? Well, I, I think it is a concern, Mike, because sometimes we say things on social media that's just, you know, we could joke around about it, 
you know, and somebody else that's reading it's going to say, hey, you know, that's not cool. I think this person needs to, we need to person. So yeah, so it, it, it could, it could go both ways, man. It really can, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it, you know, who wants, I wouldn't want anybody in my, you know, invading my privacy unless I want you to, right? Right. You went to the Supreme Court now, I guess. We might not even have the right to privacy. We thought we did. So scary times. It really is. Right. And and like you said, <clears throat> like you said, and, and you know, sometimes people say certain things. You know, you could be with your friends and they they do something, and you're like, man, I'm going to kill you. And it's like, you know, you know, that's not what that means. That you're not literally going literally going to do that. Um, but yeah. if you start bringing in law enforcement and government on every issue, there could be, you know, like you said, an overreach. There could be an overreaction on certain things, like we're seeing with police being called out to mental health calls and they're reacting at with criminal force instead this person needs you know mental health counseling or some kind of talking down um so there is a there is that danger of overreach and and then the idea of just everything that we're saying is being monitored by by law enforcement is also very very scary um in the things that people kind of complain or accuse countries like china and Russia and North Korea of doing it's like do we do we really want to think about that here we talked about this before that really was always a liberal principle right the idea of privacy essentially that we shouldn't have the government breathing down our neck that was all <clears throat> how it became a conservative idea the script was flipped on that one right because remember when the 50s the conservatives were you know with the McCarthy rules they were talking about trying to get your your neighbors to turn you in and listen to your conversations and breathing down your neck so like and then even after 9-11 the patriot act was originally put forth by the bush administration of course obama continued it but that was originally from a republican president absolutely you know on the nypd's website i just wanted to bring this up we actually do have something called smart social media analysis and research team and according to their site, it analyzes social media for chatter, videos, and relative information in regards to active investigations. But then it says a smart unit also identifies patterns and trends on social media, such as bullying, gang activity, and types of crimes, and translates the information into usable intelligence for patrol officers in the field. Smart also collects and memorializes this information as evidence in police investigations. And then they go and they give presentations to the public and agencies on the dangerous uses of social media. So there actually is a branch of law enforcement that does this, the question is, I guess, do we want them to do more of it as a governor is calling for? Maybe that should be the poll question for the week. Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. Um, it's a question that for so many, uh, many people are probably listening it's, are saying yes or no. I think it's something that the audience, I think, should, should really, you know, put their two cents in this as well. Your audience, yeah, so let's put it out there. I would love to see. Let's, let's, see. Let's, let's do it. Question of the week is, do you believe that the government should do more to scrutinize social media activity to identify potential problems? You know, Mike, and what's crazy is that, you know, Big Brother's always listening. Big Brother's always, I mean, if you have an I, I have an iPhone and you can say anything you want, it'll pop up on your phone. You know, it'll pop up. You're looking for sneakers. Nike. I have a story about this. And some people might think I'm crazy, like the UFO story. But I swear this happened to me. I went to the Bronx Zoo once. Now, I never Googled Bronx Zoo. I didn't put in anything about animals. I didn't type in anything about the I didn't take pictures. I just went to the Bronx Zoo. Mm-hmm. And, of course, when I was there, I was speaking about the zoo, the people I was with, right? But I didn't type it into my phone. After I left, I started getting ads on my phone for zoo tickets. I was like, next time, I'm gonna buy a tour with us. Next time, use this link. Next time. It yeah. knew, my phone knew I was at the Bronx Zoo just mm-hmm. maybe by GPS or maybe by hearing the words I was saying, but I wasn't Googling it. it just, the phone just picked it up. Yeah. My GPS, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jay. No, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to repeat what, you know, what I said before. Big Brother is always listening. Big Brothers, I, you listen, I live about six miles away from Indian Point. And yeah, I took a picture, right, from across the river. And I said, I posted on Facebook, I said, what's wrong with this picture, right? 
I had many thoughts. It's scary, you know. And before you know it, I, I'm, I'm, I, I am. There's this thread, all about Indian Point, and I'm like, I don't know anybody on this thread. And it, and it was like, oh man, I let me just erase this picture, man, because <laughs> it, it got really scary. It really did. And I'm like, that's what I said. You know, somebody's listening, regardless of what. Somebody would always listen. That's their job is to listen. What she's saying is, should we listen a little closely, right? That's what the governor is saying. Now, again, Mike, I'm glad you, you know you, you put that out there and hopefully we can get some answers from your audience. All right. And you know, we live in a social media world. So I don't think it's reasonable to say we don't want law enforcement to be on social media. That's that's going to hinder their ability to do their job and you know just that's the world we live in i mean it's very common you see the precincts post up information about crimes and they say if you have any tips let us know a lot of that is done through social media um how active are they monitoring social media accounts i don't know they're certainly looking at the groups like the neighborhood groups to see what's going on in there and i think that's part of the job right to stay alert to your surroundings i think yeah and i think you know, most people probably already assume that they're being that that everything's being monitored. Um, and I think we do, we do want, we would like, so I guess, law enforcement to at least pay attention to trends that are happening, and then kind of look into it if there's some kind of trouble going on. Um, I think what we probably want to know is what does she mean by look closer? Like, how much more, you know, how much closer is she talking about um, in that regard? So yeah, I think the issue was that this guy had posted, I guess, a manifesto, and yet law enforcement wasn't on top of the situation until obviously after the tragedy happened. Right. And, and if you remember, like after 9 11, um, when um, what, Top Art Bernard Homeland Security and, and um, all those agencies, NSA and such, were on such high alert, and there were these stories popping up in the news all the time where there was like a knitting club in California of like older women that you know got visited by you know secret service um for just some innocuous reason because they were just on such high alert on everything and it's just these types of stories kept coming out it's like do we want that um in regards to social media and social media posts when we're putting these things out there so i think we need to define on how much deeper how much closer they're talking about and what exactly it is that they're trying to do in that regard james in the chat says i think the right became so concerned about privacy when they started banning Donald Trump from social media and all the people posting about conspiracy theories and all that. I, I think, think they're probably even longer though. I think a little longer, but I think that also probably, you know, ramped up because people, you know, the one thing the right has is, is you know, they, they jump on, on a cause and they, and they stick to it, you know, and um, when that happened, their savior was, was banned. Um, that rallied a lot of people. But somehow this idea of freedom and privacy got tied to the conservative idea of small government, which has been an idea of theirs, obviously, for a while, but they were somehow able to co-opt, so to take over this privacy, you know, freedom from government intervention, and, and kind of align it with the small government philosophy, which really wasn't the case, I don't think, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And I think um, just on, on the point of, you know, being monitored and everyone has these stories about like, uh, you know, we're talking about you mentioned something on your phone or, or you know, you go here and whatnot. Um, I think another part is that there's a lot that goes on with the phones and advertising and targeted advertising that people don't realize as well that kind of contributes to that. So like when you took the picture at that place, each one of your pictures, unless you turn it off, in most cases, are is tagged with, you know, geo information, GPS information that says where it's at. Mm -hmm. And these these ad platforms can read the metadata that's in your phones. Unless you turn this stuff off, it, it'll have it. Because you can even check on your phone. Sometimes they have organizational software on your phone where you can be like, oh, well, you know, uh, categorize these pictures from where I took them. Um, and it's the same with where you visit. If you've got location services on, on your phones, then those can be used by advertisers if you allow it. At least I know on in Apple's case, you can turn off certain things, um, but it's it's usually on by default, and people don't don't realize it. 
Right. Now, of course, we're not talking about government you know, overreach at this point. We're talking about companies doing it. But even so, right. people have an expectation that they're not or they shouldn't be. I think I think they feel like it's right. wrong that they're spied on by right. their phone. I mean, I think they understand maybe if they're typing something into Google, if they're writing it on Facebook, if they're posting on Instagram. But if they right. just take a picture or if they just use their phone for something that they don't think is connected to their Internet activity, they think it's just their own device. They don't expect that to be used against them, if you want to call it that. Right, I, I agree. Yeah, one of the things that I always do is say, and I know exactly what you're talking about, Jay, because I always make sure that my location is always off. You know, always off. I, I, you don't need to track me. I'm not a kid, right? But uh, so yes, I understand what you're saying. You have to make sure that your locations are off. You're, a lot of people like to do that. Uh, hey, guess where I'm at? I'm at, you know, whatever, you know, and for me posting that picture up there and getting this thread that when I was reading this, I, it was the most scariest thing in the world. I, I deleted the picture. I'm like, yeah, everything disappeared. Yeah. And it's, it's out there. Like, even if, um, you know, some of these platforms or these ad platforms, you can target people who have just visited a certain area. Right. Um, Say you want to target people who were in NYC within the last week or people who you know live in NYC or people who are going to visit NYC, right? So the metadata from different things that you do and activities and, and information that's fed into these systems, you know, go into these ad platforms. And you know, if you've got Facebook, um, the Facebook app on your phone, sometimes this, this information can be shared. And, and it's not only that, it's when you're on another website. Um, if you're on another website that's got Facebook, something that Facebook's implemented, then Facebook knows you went to that website. And all this goes into building, building these targeted audiences and these things. And it brings up this, these situations where we're like, hey, I didn't say anything. Why is this showing up here? It's like, well, you know, you were here. You were there. This just happened. And your phone says it. And this app says it. Yeah. So I, I, okay. I, I think we should go back to the beepers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take a beeper any day. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta learn. You gotta learn the codes. Then we gotta re re relearn the codes. What was it one one three four? Was I I love you one one four three? That is hello one, four, three. Yeah, and it's upside down also for the codes. Yeah, upside down. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. We used to do that on our calculators also before we had beepers. We used to type numbers That's in right. back there upside down. That's <laughs> that, that was the original beeper. <laughs> yep. Speaking of overreach, I wanted to talk about our poll from last week that we did, because yeah. it also was kind of about overreach, at least one can argue that it was. We asked about whether campaign accounts should be frozen if a politician is either convicted or resigns while there is an investigation into alleged wrongdoing on their part. So that was really the part that we focused on, the allegations, because what they're saying is, as part of this bill, which is pending before the New York, New York State Legislature, if a politician resigns while there is an investigation, so in other words, while they've been accused, they haven't been convicted of anything, they haven't been found liable necessarily, they're just accused of doing something wrong. Under this law, or this bill, if it became a law, their campaign account would be frozen. Question is, did we think that was a good idea? Do we think that was unconstitutional? We put it out to the people. Now, I know Jay, you had a little bit of a different result. On my social media, I actually I was I was surprised. 63% of the people said yes, it was a good idea. 37% said no. To me, that was a lot because again, we're talking about accusations here. Now, the context behind this, for those who don't know, this is being pushed by people who are very firmly against Andrew Cuomo. And it's pretty transparently a stop Cuomo bill. They wanted him to be convicted of some of these things. He wasn't. So now they can't say your account is frozen if you're convicted. They're saying if you're convicted or if you resign during an investigation. So I think that's where it falls apart constitutionally. We talked about this last week. We had another attorney on with us talking about you have a right to free speech, you have a right to due process. How are you going to punish someone? How is the government going to punish someone who has not been convicted of something? So in my opinion, it went too far. Nonetheless, 63% of my respondents like the idea. Right. And I had uh, mine was evenly split was 50 50. Um, and I did get a comment um, from 
mutual friend of ours uh, sent a comment in and it kind of echoed what we had talked about in that if it's allowed to to freeze campaign funds just on the accusation then it's going to be it can be weaponized then any political campaign every candidate is going to go ahead and accuse the other candidate of something so that they can freeze their their campaign funds and just be chaos at that point you know so yeah it was 50 50 on on uh on my end what do you think wow um you can just high break and vote pretend you're voting in his poll and you can tip it one way or the other <laughs> i mean that's um that's that's uh it's a good question man i mean you know what i don't think it should be frozen you know i it's you're innocent to prove a guilty right um what i do feel is that if they haven't already if you are guilty you should just lose your pension and lose everything else that comes with it um i'm not sure if they're doing that mike maybe you could correct me on that um but they should be punished and they shouldn't get a pension if they're convicted as far as the money in the bank Listen, if you owe money to the IRS, guess what they're going to do, right? They're going to freeze everything you have. So they, they're... No, you know, this is a campaign account and it's not in your name, right? And they, there's, right. Issue, there's something called piercing the corporate veil. And there's been some funny cases about that, about applying that same concept to campaign accounts. But technically, it isn't your money, right? It's a separate entity, which is your campaign. So, Mike, I don't know what's the, the rule on that, right? But I could tell you that... Um, they sh it shouldn't be frozen until again until you're proven guilty um you're proven guilty then i think you know every, it's a game changer so I agree. I, and and it, we also spoke on that last week as as well the attorney that was on with us last week as far as politicians um people in authority people in, in this, this responsibility to have the public trust police politicians all this should be held to a higher standard and there should be higher consequences um because you know better you're you're tasked with with doing better the responsibility and trust of the people to do better and so if you do these things that you know you shouldn't be doing then yeah you should be held to a higher standard that means freezing your account once you're found guilty um and losing your pension etc then yeah, i'm all for it you'd be all fine for with that if it was predicated on the person being found guilty i don't think that the government should or constitutionally is able to step in and punish someone who is not you do you have rights whether you like the person politically or not they have a right to use their campaign money for political speech and that's what andrew cuomo is doing and everyone else who has a right to do it can do it you know it's just part of the game and, and right. they're guilty yes absolutely punish them and punish them to a higher degree than you would punish someone who doesn't hold the public's trust i agree with that as well but there's right. also the idea and this was brought up last week by our guest that once you do your time once you're let's say off parole or off probation whatever your punishment was shouldn't you get your rights back i mean in new york we allow people to vote again once they've done their time so why wouldn't they then be allowed to run for office and use their campaign money at that point or, or even run again i i there's a few cases out there where you have some convicted um, elected officials that are running. Yeah. In fact, some of them hold office today. That is true. On, on a lower scale. That's right. On a lower scale, but they're, they're, they're out there. They're out there. Anybody does research on the internet would, would know, you know, so, you know, again, we, you know, I, like you said, Mike, and, and I think, you know, we all agree on this. If, if you're guilty, you should get, nothing period you know you did your time you lose your money you know and besides it's the money that we gave you it's the money that the average joe gave you that couldn't afford probably a, a gallon of milk but they said you know what here's 50 cents or here's a dollar for your campaign it's not fair it's not fair for the average person mm -hmm. that you can't you can uh, get to keep all that after you committed a crime or fraud or whatever you want to call it i don't think it's fair right that's my opinion though <laughs> no, and i agree um it kind of it kind of um relates to uh an article that came out uh yesterday um there's a supreme court decision that ruled in favor of ted cruz and um it was a case involving the use of campaign funds to repay personal campaign loans after the campaign was over and so they wanted to put forth a cap, a cap on it, and um, 
the Supreme Court struck it down. Ted Cruz was against putting a cap on it. Um, but that could also be an issue. Like you said, they're not their personal funds, but if the campaign is over and they wanna use this to repay campaign funds, there's that potential for, you know, basically money washing. You know, if I take a loan from, from Scala at a million dollars and he's like, okay, well, 10% um, on the loan. Okay, we've cut a deal later that we're gonna split that. After the campaign is over with, I pay you back, you know, a million, a million one, and then we split the 50. Now that now that money is free and clear mine, it's no longer, you know, campaign stuff. But so, the thing is, after a campaign, you often do have debts. And sometimes, in fact, you have to raise money, which is very difficult and embarrassing for a lot of people to do in the first yep. place. Imagine having to do it after the campaign is over. So, and now I've got to yeah. do a fundraiser. I'm not running for anything. I'm just raising money to pay off people that I owe during the campaign. True. That's true. And most of the time, this is what you get zero (laughs) nobody's going to give you money if you're not running right right? um i know correct me if i'm wrong mike um state state senate and assembly there's i know there's no matching funds not yet but they they also don't have to uh after their campaign is over they lost they don't really have to it's not like city council that you have to go back and show all these receipts and you did this that the audit is not as crazy but the right. reason for that is the matching funds, right? The city wants to know what you did with every dollar because it's public money at play. Right. Once the state goes to the matching fund system, I'm sure you're going to see stronger audits at the state level as well. I think it'd be a, a game changer for sure. Yep. I think the public would probably want the, those audits as well because like you said, it's the public's money. You know, they want to know, make sure that's being they used. Run for and they go through it, right? Say what? <laughs> No, they'll want it until they're on the other side of it, until they've run for office and they've experienced what it's like. Yes, I think the principle of it is great, right? But when you're in it, like I'm going through it right now for my campaign because it happens months later. It's not fun. And, and not just when I say it's not fun, I don't just mean like that's not enjoyable to do. What I mean is I think that there is overreach there sometimes in, in the way that it's done. I think there can be a lot of reform not to let people off the hook, but to just be more reasonable. I don't think it's very reasonable at times. For example, I'll just give you one example. They put a lot of pressure on you to close your campaign account right away and give them the balance of the money. And that's something that's already a little bit iffy to me. Like, why are you making me give you my entire campaign balance? The way they look at it is any money that was spent first, they presume to be private money. And any money that has not been spent, they presume to be public money, which is kind of an arbitrary distinction, but that's how they view it. So that anything left over, they're going to assume belongs to them. So, all right, they want you to close your account, send them the balance. Then months later, they come in and they do an audit and they're asking you for every piece of documentation. Sometimes it might be something that you didn't have and you would like to be able to go to your bank and get the record, maybe even log into your website through your bank and, and pull, pull a record. Well, now you can't because they already pressured you to close the account and send them the money months ago. And now you got to go to the bank. Sometimes they, you know, they, they're going to charge you or they're going to take forever while the city pressures you. No, we need this tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. It's like, well, then maybe you should have let us kept our account open a little, little bit longer, knowing that there would be an audit process coming up. You know, so there are things like that that really don't make a lot of sense. Yeah. That's politics. that's why people a lot of people don't like politics Mike you know it's just I mean that's that's on that side right then you have the other side but um but you're right they scrutinize everything you do and and we didn't get into it speaking of politics we didn't get into into you yourself and your your background my background well you know I'm uh, I I, yeah I, I was into politics for many many years I I got into politics back in uh, 2000. I was in college. Um, and then, you know, I just, it didn't work out for me. I guess it wasn't a perfect match, right? And I went a different route. I'm actually now um, the CEO for a non for profit. I spearhead uh, two homeless shelters with children. And that's been my passion ever since. Um, it's helping the children and helping the families get on their feet, making sure that. They're properly housed, making sure that they don't come back into the system again. Um, I, I, um, 
I have a big staff. I have 138 employees and I micromanage everyone. And, um, and that's how I keep myself, you know, and keep them out of trouble because you have to make sure that you are providing the proper services for the people, right? You can't mandate anybody, but those that want the, the, the service, you have to give, you really do have to give. And um, I know that nobody wants a shelter in their backyard. I listen, I get that. I completely understand, but you know, and, and everybody blames the Department of Homeless Services and this and that. It's listen, if you thought that the the, the campaign finance board demanding, you have no clue when you deep inside with DHS, the, the the hoops that make you go through, right? I always blame, and I've always said this from day one, Mike. You have to look at the provider. The provider is the person that sets the tone, right? If you're in it for the money, get out. It's not for you. If you're in it because you wanna help the community, you wanna help the person and the families, then do what you do. You gotta love it. And that's why I'm in it, Mike. You know, I've been very blessed to house a lot of people, at least my team, right? I'm only as good as my team. And I have a good staff. I meet with them weekly. I make sure that you know, whatever barriers we have, we get them out the way and we make sure that, and I personally, Mike, I personally like to, to, to show up unannounced a lot of times. And one of the things that I love doing that I enjoy the most is talking to the residents without them telling, without me telling them who I am, right? I don't tell them who I am. And look, this is how I dress. I have a sweatshirt, not a sweatshirt, but, you know, a dress, you, you know, whatever. And I look like the average Joe. And I'll go up to a person in the elevator or the hall and says, how you doing? I don't tell them who I am. How are they treating you here? And let me tell you, they'll be the first ones to either praise you or curse you out. Right. And if there's an issue, I said, well, follow me. And they like and they look at me like, who the hell are you? Because, you know, you get that type of language. Who the hell are you? Well, I'm the executive director. I'm the one that runs this place. Oh, okay. Come on, let's go see your caseworker. We got to get you out of here. You know, we got to find you a permanent housing. And we and we do what we can. Mike, um, I have to say that I've run into some very interesting people. And I've also ran into a lot of very nice people that, that are just going through the emotions and they are um, getting back on their feet again. And, you, and those are the people you have to help. You know, we can't paint everybody with the same paintbrush, man, because it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. I have a very passion, strong passion for the job that I do. Um, I know a lot of good people in DHS that really care a lot. And believe me, if something happens, the smallest thing, I get a phone call. I have, I have um, two buildings. One in Bronx, one in Brooklyn. I have in one building I have 120 cameras, and those and I, in the other building I have close to 100 cameras, and all those cameras are on my phone. And if you look at me right now, I look half dead. It's be sleep at night looking through my cameras, and if I, God forbid, I see somebody nodding their head like this, I make that phone call. And there's been times, and mind you now, I live far, I live very far from my job. Yeah, you're hearing this. Uh, we <laughs> we were that? About big brother is always watching you. We have big brother on the show. Yeah, that's, that's right. Cool. I'm always watching, man. I'm always watching. I'm always watching my guys, making sure that everything's right, Mike. You know, the la there's two things that I'm afraid of, Mike. And I'll tell your audience this. I'm afraid of the cops and I'm afraid of the New York Post, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and believe me when I tell you, you know, those are two people, two, two entities that I'm afraid of. And, and because of that, you know, and not only because of that, but because I have the passion to really, to really help out. And, I, and if anybody out here is listening and you have a shelter and you feel that that shelter is not doing the proper thing, you know, every shelter has a board of directors. Reach out to the board of directors because the board of directors is... Um, 
is the CEO's boss. Those are the people that don't get paid. So they'll be, be believe me, they'll beat the hell out of you because, you know, because they want to make they want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. It's oversight. You have to have oversight. Because you have a big you have a big responsibility there. The danger of having someone who does his job as well as you is that you might make it too nice for people and they don't want to ever leave. Yes, Mike. In fact, every apartment that I that for every person that moves out. I repaint the apartment. I do everything. You walk in there and yes. And there's been times when people don't want to leave, you know? So, and, and, you know, you, I hear other people say, well, you know, you shouldn't make it so easy for them. No, no, that mentality needs to stop. Yeah. You know, it needs to stop. That mentality needs to stop. They deserve a good apartment. If I'm providing them an apartment here, good. I, this is what exact. This is what I expect from my housing specialist. Okay, this is what I expect from them: a decent apartment in a decent neighborhood with their schools, where there's a playground for these children. Okay, because us adults, you know, we could be here today, gone tomorrow, right? But it's the children that we have to think about, Mike. Those are the ones. That's our future. I I micromanage everybody. We have a board of ed, uh, department of board of ed on site, just to let you know that for uh, every families with children, every shelter of families with children, they have a department with the board of ed. And I sit with these guys every Friday and I want to know the attendance of my children. I want to know who's going to school and who's not, because I and my caseworkers and my team will be knocking on your door making sure that your kid go to school. Right. That's the way it is. You actually have a building, and you said you have two buildings with, with apartments in them. And that's important. You see some of these contracts that are not for apartment-style shelters, but they're just really like warehouse-style shelters. And in many cases, they're paid more per month. The providers are paid more per month than it would cost to put them in an actual apartment. And that becomes an issue. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if <laughs> it is an issue, Mike. You know, it is. But I don't know how the system upstairs work from, from the feds down, right? If that's the way they work, then they work backwards, to be honest with you. And I completely understand what you're saying. When they pay a night so much money when they could give it to someone else as, a, you know, a rent an apartment. Well, yeah, and I would rather see them in a facility like yours even than some of these dormitory staff. Uh -huh. Right? You've been, been to my facility, Mike. I have. Beautiful. I, I mean, for a shelter, I think it's really nice. Well, you know, one of the things that I tried, Mike, is not to make it look like a shelter, right? Look, I could have my job today, tomorrow, my house could burn down. I could be in a shelter myself, right? The last thing I want is to sleep in somebody in somebody's shelter that smells like urine, that smells like anything that you don't want to smell, right? That's not the way it works here. My place here, my shelters, if they don't look like a regular apartment, there's no metal detectors, there's no scanning, none of that stuff. But we, we, I have my own security, Mike. I don't sublease anything. We have our own security. And believe me, I'm on top of everybody. Or, or I'm on top of all my directors, you know, but my housing specialist, that their job is to make sure they find uh, the proper apartments for these people. They better be right. They better come correct because I will spot check you. You know, I have no issue with that. I have a car, man. I'll drive anywhere, you know, and, yeah. and I'm hands on. I'm hands on, Mike. I'll get busy with my maintenance guys. We got to go up there and cut the grass. We got to go up there and snow blow anything. I ain't even afraid of work. A lot of things we talked about audits. I think the DHS really needs to be audited more than anyone. But when it comes to Ruiz, I can vouch personally that he's on top of his game and he is above board and he is really the model person that you want involved in the system. We need more people like William Ruiz, I think, in the system. Thank you, Mike. One of, yeah. And, and believe it or not, you know, you have the state and then you have the city that. This, then you have the providers in the bottom. You have OTDA. I, I can't right now, the Office of uh, Temporary 
Disability um, Act, something like that. Um, they oversee DHS, right? And then DHS comes down to us. So they get audited. I, I mean, the, the, the audits come from like this, right? It's like, it trickles down. It really does. You know, and I'm very, I'm a stigler when it comes to paperwork. My CFO doesn't sleep at night. This guy texts me every morning at five. I tell him, bro, get some sleep, you know? Um, but again, audits are very important. Audits are very, very important. And I'm glad right now that DHS is cracking down on those providers that think they could get over. You know, a couple of them have gone down already because DHS is on top of them. I praise them. Kudos to DHS. Well, that's what we need more of. More Absolutely. Of. Back to our taxpayer money, right? We want to make sure that we spent properly and not wasted and there's no corruption. And we want to crack down on that to the extent possible. So definitely, yep. need, definitely need more like Will who are good faith actors in this. One of, the, one of the things, Mike, I'm sorry. One of the things that I tell DHS and I, and I usually talk to the second person in command besides you know, the, the commissioner, the second in command. And I tell her, I said, do, do me a favor. I want you to come visit me. And, and the second favor I want you to do is don't tell me when you're coming. <laughs> surprise me keeps okay you, it keeps you honest right you keep yourself honest by doing that absolutely come see me at any time pop up i don't care you know i'm not afraid of you coming down because i know that you know i'm the sheriff in town man you know <laughs> i'm the sheriff in town that's you important know? is there is there where can people go to find more about um your organization and, and what you do or even to get involved or you know yeah, you, I, I have a, a website. My website is highlandparkcdc.org. You're going to find a, a few of those in different states. They're not mine. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm here in New York City. So, you, yeah, you, I, you could always go there. I have a Facebook page as well of the things that we do with the children and stuff like that, the activities. You know, so, you know, believe it or not, I'm talking now to you guys about DHS. DHS doesn't want to talk to the media because I have to ask them permission first. But you know what? The good news has always got to spread, right? Right. Good news has always got to spread. It. And I have to say that, you know, a lot of people, you know, they shoot them down. They really do, but they don't understand the gut, the stuff that DHS does behind the scenes that people don't, don't see. You know, they really care and they've really put pressure on, on those that need to be pressured. So kudos to, to DHS, you know? Well, full disclosure, I do have a lawsuit pending, but on a very specific issue. And, you know, want to know that everything is a case by case basis. I think they do certain things right and certain things need to be more scrutinized and you take it as it comes. Uh, but I commend you I, again for everything uh, that you do. I know that you're one of the good people out there in, in this. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. So I did want to talk on couple of different things. Number one, when it comes to guns, and I know you mentioned earlier, the guns are always going to be out there, but I think that we need to have a good faith discussion about gun regulation in the state and federally, because if you look at guns that are committed or are recovered, guns recovered from crimes committed in New York, they're almost always from out of state. And you can see that they're from the states where it's easier to get them. In other words, where the gun laws are less strict. And what I've always said, or at least for the past few years, I guess I've been pushing for this. I would like to see a state of origin law in New York where anytime a gun is recovered from a crime, the public can go online and look up to see where that gun came from. Only because I'm tired of the talking point that you hear all the time, that gun regulation only helps criminals and it does nothing to protect law-abiding people. That is complete nonsense. And I think showing that the guns used illegally come from those states with the lax laws will eradicate that talking point and show that, yes, it's a matter of availability. And it's very much a federal issue because guns are transported so easily across state lines. But if you have tighter regulation and if you do more to, uh, to ensure that people can only get guns who should have them in the first place, then it will decrease the amount of guns that we find illegally on the streets. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think 
there definitely needs to be more things in place. And like you said, with, with the New York law, uh, most of it's coming from over state lines. And then that, that, that brings a talking point to, to those people saying, well, look, look at New York. Look, it's, it's, they got gun issues there. Well, no, it's because it's coming from somewhere else. So guns are not native New Yorkers. I've heard right. this so many times over recently. They're saying that, well, look, New York has tight gun laws and there are so many guns on the street. So the gun laws do nothing. Where are the guns coming from? And they're not coming from other states with laws like New York. They're coming right. from Virginia. They're coming from North Carolina. They're coming from Pennsylvania in some cases. But look at the laws in those states. You know, people talk about 3D printing now and that kind of stuff. You know, but come on, let's have a serious discussion about these guns that we're finding are mostly guns that are originally bought in stores or by manufacturers in other states where it's easier to get them. And then they're smuggled in. So it's a matter, again, it's a matter of availability and showing where they come from. They, People really aren't pulling most of these guns uh, out of a printer. They're just not. <laughs> right. Excellent. You, know, you know, Mike, I have a few friends that, that are former cops. And they said, you know what? If New Yorkers were allowed to carry guns, maybe the crime will go down. Right. But we're not Florida. <laughs> you know, what do you think about that? No, I, I don't think that we should have everyone carrying a gun. And to me, that's not the correct approach. And empirically, that's not gonna lower the crime rate. I think that's just going to lead to more fear, people being on edge. It's like you wanna turn it into the wild west. It's like, like, like you said, that's not what we are. It's not what we value here. People aren't gonna feel safe at knowing that everyone has a gun and, and more guns. Like, again, and to me, it's about the number of guns floating around. So if you're saying that we all should have guns, you know what that means? Again, this means that more criminals are going to have guns. People don't understand that. They think that all the criminals already have guns and all the people who are law-abiding don't or can't get them in New York or it's too hard for them. Or, but that's not the case. It's about the number of guns that are floating around. If, if you make it easier for everyone to have them, then more people who shouldn't have them are also going to get them. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you, get, then you get on the other side of that story, Mike, where people say, well, you know, if that guy carries a gun, maybe I'll think twice about about robbing them, right? So just, yeah, I mean, there's two sides to the store. I mean, listen, I'm against guns completely. I'm against guns. How you want to be around a gun, you know? But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a discussion that a lot of people that I've come across where they're like, well, you know, if we had guns, uh, they'll think twice about robbing us. You know, I'm like, well, you're legal to have a gun. You're a retired cop. You can carry a gun. You know, I can't. So you can say that, but um. And if I could, I wouldn't do it, Mike. You know, I have children. I, I don't trust guns. And and it also brings up another thing. If it's, uh, if you got everyone's got guns and it's open carry or or or, or even concealed carry, um, if the police are already on edge now when stopping people, how much more on edge are they going to be if they think everyone is armed? I, it's it's a recipe for disaster in that in that, you know. In that situation you're just going to make people more afraid to right, interact yeah. with anyone it's you know and then it's going to in turn i think lead to people being more aggressive because they're they're going to use offense as a means of defense right they're trying to protect themselves so that's like let me let me be the aggressor first before they can come at me right and then there's going to be been the false bravery now that you've got a gun and there's going to be more of that it's going to go on and then you got more people that are going to get caught in crossfires from you know two people doing this it's just yeah think about women also who are already afraid of uh, men coming on too strongly uh, you know what if there's a concern that everyone has a gun uh, you know how are you gonna politely decline someone coming on to you if you think that they're armed yeah. right she'll pull the first trigger like no buddy it ain't happening it's <laughs> <laughs> not you're right. no you're right it's scary, then. It really is. Yeah. But, oh, a lot could be said on this stuff. Of course, I am an attorney. I respect the Constitution and the Second Amendment. I'm not, not saying that no one should have it. I'm right. saying we're smart and we have to have common sense. And I just hate the idea because it's wrong. It's factually wrong that only people who want to commit crimes have guns and gun laws only affect the people who don't want to commit crime. That's just nonsense. Right? It's a matter of availability. That's why if I can get one thing done in my time of public service, it's that. 
it's eradicating that myth. Um, again, look at where the guns are coming from. They're not native New Yorkers. I think that's an important point to make. But in the very last couple of minutes here, I did want to give a brief update on the redistricting situation. I know I've said in prior weeks that all the election law work that I did was bought because the districts were all thrown out and we're starting all over again. Turns out that's not entirely true. And I'm actually relieved to hear that the work that I did is going to count because the latest ruling that came out, this is like so sloppy, but the latest ruling that came out was if you made the ballot originally before the lines were thrown out, you can still be on the ballot under the new lines. You just now have to pick which district you're running for, which is a very strange way to do it, but that's what the judge said. So if you were running for state Senate and you qualified, you were not thrown off the ballot, right? They, they judged you on the ballot. There are no lines anymore, but as these new lines are coming out, you can say, you know what? I'm gonna run for this new seat now. Um, they've got to do that. I mean, if they're going to honor those existing positions, they have to do something like that because the lines are all changing. So you can't say you can only run for the seat that you were going to run for before because that seat doesn't exist anymore. They're all new lines. Um, there are still constitutional and legal barriers that must be met. For example, if you're running for the state Senate, normally under the law, you have to have lived in that district for the prior year. Because this is a redistricting year, though, the law states that you only have to live in that county for the past year. So if you're from Queens and you made the ballot for state Senate, you can now declare for any state Senate district that includes Queens. You can't say I'm going to run for some seat of state that doesn't have Queens in it. Of course, it could be a multi-county seat. Like there's a new seat. I think there's Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. You could do that one, but it's got to have your home borough in it. If you're running for Congress, because Congress is also affected by this. If you made the ballot for Congress, the only requirement when it comes to your residency is that you live in New York State. That's a constitutional thing. So if you made the ballot previously for Congress, you can now declare for any congressional seat in New York State, which is kind of wild also, right? Someone who could have petitioned to get on the ballot for Congress here in Queens can be like, I'm going to run upstate and don't even have to petition for it just automatically. And we'll see if that happens. It'll be interesting to see if a candidate actually does something like that. But we're now left with a situation where we have two primaries, unless it changes, things can still change, there are ongoing lawsuits. Two primaries in New York, and people should know that. June 28th, the original one, and August 23rd. June 28th is going to be the seats that were not affected so far by this. So it's the governor's race, your lieutenant governor, the controller, and the state assembly as of now, although that's still being challenged in court, but the assembly and related seats like district leader and things that spring from assembly districts, June 28th. August 23rd, you're going to have the primary for Congress and for state Senate under these new lines that are being finalized. So two primaries and a general election this year. What a crazy time to be an election lawyer or to be a voter in New York State for that matter. My question for you. Yeah. Hoko Oswazi. <laughs> or Jumani, for that matter, right? Or Jumani. Yeah, I have not made an endorsement. Honestly, I'm still looking to see. I'm not, to be perfectly honest with you, I am not overly thrilled with any of them. Um, I don't think Jumani is really actively campaigning at this point even. I think he knows that fact in the cards. So it's really between those two that you mentioned. Uh, I don't know. I Of the two, I will say that I guess I'm partial to Hokel at this point, but I'm not exactly thrilled with some of her positions either. So we'll see how it plays out. What about you? Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking possibly Swansea. Mm. You know, I, I think um, he's, he's out there hitting. He was out in Woodhaven just recently. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, um, but he's hitting the campaign. And I think that Hoko, you know, she's. Um, uh, so I have so much to say. I don't know if I want to say it, <laughs> you know, but. Um, hey, fair enough. Say what you got to say. You know, she she's picked her, her, uh, her running mate from up here, from uh, upstate uh, Delgado. Um, I think she's. I had a rap song about Delgado. The same guy, or just just the name? No, the same guy. Look at that. I dealt with his lawyers in court. I beat his lawyers, and he's going to say they're not his lawyers. It was, you, you know, when he got the Democratic primary for Congress, the right. lawyers came in, and it's like, you know, he's going to have that plausible deniability and say he didn't hire them. They're just working on his behalf, but they were there trying to, quite frankly, change the law to make it easier to kick people off the ballot. And I was there to step in and say, no, you have to follow the law. You have to follow the process. It's 
Fair right. play. Someone doesn't qualify for the ballot. They should not be on the ballot. I totally agree with that. But you've got to do it the right way. They were trying to expand the law to make it so that even if you didn't serve them properly, they could be knocked off. And I said, you got to put your foot down somewhere. The service provisions are in place for a reason. If you're going to knock someone off the ballot, at least follow the process. Right. I, I you know, picking Delgado, which is he, he's from up up north. Um, he's not known in the city. He's not known downtown, what we call downtown. He's not known. And I think that that I think she's running on on the last name, you know, because it's Hispanic last name. Um, so that's where I, I think that's it's probably going to help her. Right. But you also have Swazi. Swazi's running with Diana Reyna. And Diana and Reyna. Primary, you don't see that. I mean, you can get information from the campaigns about their tickets but they're separate primaries, right? So when you go to vote, you're not going right. to see them together. Right. And that's going to be challenging because you have two Spanish people running for the same, that same seat. Diana's very well known up here in the city, right? And this is where you get your most votes, right? You know, you look at New York, New York State, and yeah, people say, wow, New York State is big, but it's, it's mainly land, you know? And if you come up further up north, Mike, you know this better than anybody, the homes are separate from each other. You, you know, do they have projects up here? I don't know, I haven't seen them, you know, but I can tell you that if you go to Bushwick, you go to Queensbridge and you go to the Bronx, you're going to get a lot of votes up there. And it's how you campaign. I think that if, they, um, if, if they're smart enough, they should be down here as you and I, as all three of us and all your listeners are listening. They should be out there right now campaigning. You know, Mike, the way we did things back in our days, you know, campaigning at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, hitting the people that are coming out of the, the train stations because they work nights. You don't see them during the day. These are the people you need to see. And they and I'm not saying for them to be here at two or three in the morning, but they need to show face. Right. They need to come to the neighborhoods, to the East New York section, to the Ozone Park to, you know, to all over the city. They're up here. I haven't seen them. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but when you have two people from up north, that's going to be tough, man. I'll tell you how they can get my vote because I haven't committed 100% yet either way. They can address some local issues. Come to our area and say they're for the Rockaway Beach Line, for example. That's a good way to win me over and a lot of our voters in the area. Talk about something of local concern. Show that you care about our neighborhoods. And I, I agree. I agree, Mike. I, they need to come down and they need to get their hands dirty, right? They need to come down and sit down next to you at a, at a restaurant and talk about and listen to your concerns, right? One of the things I, we've always said, you know, why are you running for city council? Because we're here to represent you. You know, it's not about me. It's not. It's about you. It's about your concerns. I have my own concerns, but, and I could take care of my own concerns, but if you want to be heard, you need that person in city hall that's going to run and represent you, not they're going to represent themselves. And right now, Mike, I haven't seen him out there. I think she's, um, she's starting now to um, throw out some ads, right? Not as much as she should have. She should have been flooding this, I, um, I'm not sure what her treasure chest looks like, but she's got money. Know, uh, she has money. Okay. So, you know, again, she's made her mistakes and, you know, you know, you hire a Lieutenant governor that has, uh, you know, some, some flaws. Really? You My know, is I wanted to see more ambition. I never thought that she was particularly ambitious as a Lieutenant governor. I used to work with her when I worked in the Senate he, of course, showed up on the first day because it was just, just like the vice president of the United States is the president of the Senate and it's basically a formality, right? It's like a ceremonial role. They're there to break any ties, but they preside over it. It doesn't really mean much in the nitty gritty of, of the work that goes on. So same thing in Albany. She would show up, of course, on the first day of the session, preside over the state Senate. Then you wouldn't really see her again. I never really got the impression that she was too ambitious or she really had a lot that she was trying to accomplish in public service. She was a congresswoman who had to lost re-election, who was then chosen to be lieutenant governor, and she was fine in that role. But since becoming governor, I, I'm still waiting to see that fire. I want to see that she really wants it. You know what I mean? She's happy to have the position, 
but what does she want to achieve when she leaves office? What New York is she trying to leave behind? What does she want her legacy to be? What does she want to say she got accomplished during her tenure? I'm not sure I have that from her yet. I think people want to see that or hear that from from candidates, you know, to, to you know, to, to what's your reason for being here? What, what is it that you're going to do? What do you want to do? So I think it's very important. Has the been Spazi never came across as too genuine to me. He, he, he seemed almost too measured. Um, the kind of politician you would see on TV stereotypically in movies with every hair in a perfect place and just, you know what I mean? Like it, people want someone more real and I'm not saying he's not real, but I think he would need to show that side of him more, an authentic side, not someone who's just completely measured. Like you look at the poll and everything and say, that's going to be my position on every single issue or, you know what I mean? Like be, be genuine. Right. Well, let's see what happens in, um, what is it, June? Let's see what happens, man. As of now, and that could get, and I made this point also, I'm sure there will be lawsuits on this. Those petitions for governor, and I'm not saying you bring a regular election law invalidation proceeding to knock them off the ballot. What I'm saying is the entire process, the entire election for governor, which is scheduled for June 28th, to me, is invalid because of the fact that it's based, the petitions are based on the congressional lines. You have to get signatures from half the congressional districts in the state. We don't even have congressional districts now. Those elections got moved to August. So why are we still having an election in June based on congressional districts on petitions? That yeah. My well, God. Politics. <laughs> that might be. But it's going to be an interesting race, though. Can't wait. Hey, may the best candidate win. Absolutely. Appreciate you you being about, here. With just for, you know, we, we do have to go, but just before, before we go, really quick, you have Republican candidates now saying that they want to bring back the death penalty in New York. Oof. Uh, that's a big conversation, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, I don't know, Mike. You know, I think that we used to have that at one point, right? We did, and it was declared unconstitutional because of the way it was done, where jurors, could vote between the death penalty or life in prison. And what would happen is they would often choose the death penalty, even though they wanted to go with life imprisonment, but they went with the death penalty because the judge could determine if there was parole or not. And the jurors a lot of times said, we would rather have life with no parole, but you're not giving us the choice of parole or no parole. So if we go with life, we're afraid the judge was going to give parole. And instead, we're going for death. So they were sentencing people to death. They really didn't think deserved to die because they were afraid the judge was going to grant them parole. And so the whole system was deemed unconstitutional on those grounds. And we don't, we don't have it anymore. Federally, it still exists. But for state level crimes, we don't have it. But I don't see it coming back anytime soon, even if a Republican wins. I don't think that's going to happen, Mike. I don't think a Republican has a chance in hell of winning a, in a Democratic state. You know, I but agree. one caveat: correct one is a certain third-party candidate popping up. Yeah. Correct myself. We we did have a form of a Republican in, in a very Democratic neighborhood. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it could happen, but but no, but there is polling out there that shows that if Cuomo runs as a third-party candidate, right. it basically makes the Republican neck and neck with the Democratic nominee. Right, I think he's running. He's is he going to run on the independent line, Como? Or is it something? Yeah. I, I think that was the rumor out there. I, I'm not sure how true that is. We'll see. We'll see, man. It's, again, you know, just make sure you have your popcorn ready because it's going to be interesting. That's right. Well, thank you, Will, for joining us, and we have a lot to cover. And time went by very quickly. Thank we'll you have so much. Back on here again as well. But thank you, thank you so much. Um, just reach out to me in advance and um, I'll make myself available again. All right, excellent. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Thank you.